Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Paul goes on and he greets them now. Verse 3, grace, cherish in the Greek, and peace. Now this is the typical greeting in the Hebrew culture is to say shalom. If you look at the translation, this is actually translated from the Hebrew over to, uh, to Irene. It's the Greek word for peace, which is actually broader than shalom. It's, their, their word for peace is kind of cool. That when the Greek translators translated the New Testament, they, they actually put Irene as um, the word for peace, which Irene is like a word that is like, a, it's, it, it has like, so many depths of, it's like an onion. It has so many layers of meaning in their understanding. They believe it's the tranquility, you know, that state of, uh, uh, but not just of a personal tranquility, of a nation having tranquility. An absence um, or exemption from rage or from, the, or from the, the ravage of war. That's what they believe it is. That's true peace. Where you don't have to worry about anyone coming to attack you. But on a personal note, there's also the peace that is within the individual. And they use the same word for it, so it basically covers all bases. You know, they, they got the, the personal peace, and they, they got that, that peace, that spirit. Now, see, the Greeks were really like, we know that we have a body, we have a mind, we have a spirit. They were very intellectual. So when you said, peace be to you, they were like, peace to my body, peace to my mind, peace to my spirit. You know, like, what what... What are we, what, what word? In Hebrew, they would say shalom, which is God's peace. Shalom. Well, I mean, hey, if you got God's peace, God's peace to you, you know? And, 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 and you know, good Jew, you greet a Jew, shalom, and you say goodbye, shalom, shalom. Peace, peace, God's peace. As you go, God's peace as you come. Pretty nice. So he greets them. The Siamese twins, we call this in, in Bible school of the New Testament. Grace and peace. To the Gentiles, grace, that was their greeting, cherish. And to the Jew, shalom, peace. He says, to you guys, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus. Now I thank God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in Him, in all speech, in all knowledge, even as a testimony concerning Christ and what was confirmed in you, so that you're not lacking any gift. You're awaiting eagerly the very revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You guys have gifts. You have everything that Christ has given to enrich us. He says, you have the, you have the, I've heard the speech that you have from the Lord, the knowledge that he gives. Now, knowledge is a big deal in Greek culture, okay? You have to understand, when he's saying, I recognize God has given you knowledge, knowledge of Him. He's commending them. He says, but, he says, and, and you're waiting eagerly for, for the revelation of His Son. That day when He will come again, that He'll be revealed, and He will confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to confirm you to the end. Now, it, anyone else raised Catholic like I was? We had to go to confirmation. You know, confirmation was, you, you grew up going to church, you're learning about the Lord, you know, we went to catechism, we had, I, I went to Catholic school, so I did this all week long, but you learn about the Lord all week long, but then they come to a certain age where they feel like you're now entering an age of accountability. That you can stand up and say, I believe, not because my parents made me believe, but because I get to choose to believe. And we had a special day. I mean, it was a big deal. We had what we call confirmation, First Holy Communion. It was like you're, you're, you're entering a faith that is, you're confirming it uh, that it's yours, not because mom and dad made you, because you're supposed to be stepping up to bat now to make your own decision. But Paul says, now that, that's a manly, that, you know, the world's perspective. Of, but Paul says, you guys have been confirmed to the end blameless in the day of our Lord. Who's doing the confirmation here? Who's the one that's doing the work? Jesus. 
It's like the Lord Jesus is the one at work in you. Now that's a good, this is a really good way to, to, to deal with people if they're having a little bit of difficulties. Don't lead in with, you're screwed up. I, I say this because that's how I used to lead in. That didn't work too well. Start off with, you have a calling by God and he's called you to be sanctified as a believer by his will and he's going to confirm you to the end. You know, do the, do the Philippians. The, the, he who began a good work in you will be what? Faithful. Faithful to complete it. You know, start off with stuff like that. Because we all need to be reminded that we're just works in progress. Before you go and jump down the throat of somebody about their problem that you perceive, I always joke about this because, you know, sometimes Christians are going, that guy has such a problem with this. Have you heard him? And, you know, I think, what? I wonder what they would have thought of me if they would have met me years ago. Because if they're just judging on that, to me, that's like small potatoes. That's like surfacey stuff. God was going deep, you know, digging out some big rocks inside of problems down in the heart. He wasn't even touching the swearing stuff yet. That was going to come later. You know, the Bible says what, what comes out of a man's mouth comes from where? From the heart. Some people go, Pastor, did you know you have an elder? And he swore the other day. I heard him. Yep, we were in that church. He's got a truck driver's mouth. Almost like construction worker, bad. And like that, and I'm thinking, you think that's a big problem, don't you? But see, I've been talking to that brother, and God's dealing with him on a lot of other issues. And God's working on his heart. I, I just say, leave room. God is doing a work. Now Paul recognized that God was at work in this little church that's in a dark place, and he's going to confirm them. He's telling them, don't worry. You're eagerly awaiting for the revelation of Jesus. And God's work is going to confirm you to the end. God is going to get you through to the finish line. Why don't we start with that when we see someone struggling? Because we want to slam them for what we see wrong, right? Instead of encourage them that there's a big God who's going to help them make it. Well, I don't even know if I should go to the problem that he has to address. Look at verse 9. He says, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful. Before we talk about your problem, let's talk about God's faithfulness. It really does put things in perspective, doesn't it? When we re recognize how big a God we have and how faithful he is. His mercies are new. How often we sing that song? every morning, and great is his faithfulness. Every single day he's there for us. So Paul turns their attention to him. Before ever dealing with their problems, and that's what we should do. By the way, I think there's a lot of wisdom here. Before ever dealing with the problem, you got to point to the one who solves the problems. you got to get their focus on the answer to the problem. Don't start with the problem. Start with the answer to the problem. Then you can, the, the problems then, they, they kind of just, well, they, they become small potato. There's not a big problem then because we've got a really big problem solver. And that's what he did. In fact, for my more studious Bible students like our Jans here, the ones that have read the scriptures over and over, got a few good Bible students here, I challenge you to go look at Paul's letters and see how often he starts off his letter with this approach. Always pointing heavenward first before ever addressing anything down here. Now what if we did that with all the people we have to deal with with problems? What if we like really said, you know, it's a good thing we're all just works in progress. Good thing we got a really faithful God. A, a God who loves us so much he put us, he sanctified us. I mean, we're like up here on the... Uh, and he, he says he's faithful, and we're just waiting for his son to be revealed, and he's going to confirm us to the end. He's so good at his job, he's going to get us to the finish line. Isn't that great news? And oh, by the way, there's a little problem. But we got a really big problem solver, so I, I don't know. You want to talk about the problem? It's not that big a deal now. 
Because most of the Christians lead in with, this is a big problem. And they forgot the problem solver. Paul doesn't do that. Paul recognizes God called him and there's a very big problem solver. You know what? I'm going to stop here. Because I want to do the problem next week. But it's no big deal to me. I mean, he's got a problem that they kind of fell into a trap. And the reason I want to wait till next week is that I have a man, an older gentleman, came up to me last week and said, would I baptize him? One of our veterans walked up to me after the feeding last week and said, could I be baptized? And I told him, you know, there's a part coming up where Paul's going to talk about baptism. It's in the very next part of this chapter. Now, it's not the focus. Paul's going to say, I didn't come to baptize. That's not the focus. The focus is preaching the gospel. He actually says, I don't remember how many of the guys I baptized. That, that wasn't why God sent me. God sent me to preach this message that frees people. But he did baptize people into Christ too. And he says, and, um, you know, there's great power in baptism. But I'll, I think I'll say that for next week that I can show you because these guys fell into a, into a trap that I tell you it's a very worldly trap. And you got to remember now, they're in darkness. They're, they're in a dark city. They got worldliness all around them. So for them to fall into this and, or for that problem to actually kind of creep into the church doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, they're living in this world. But, but next week I want to show you the problem they fell into and it ties into the whole, to, you know, Paul explains it and, and, and talks about baptism as he's doing it. So if you would do me a favor, read ahead. And I want to ask you to read the rest of this chapter into the next chapter, chapter 2. I won't go all the way to, to through the next chapter, but it'll give you the idea where it's going, okay? And you keep in mind as you're reading this week, how big is the problem solver? And then you, you, you can ask yourself, how big is this problem really? I mean, is it correctable? Is it really going to be that hard to fix if we have a big problem solver? Now, if you don't have a big problem solver, this is a big problem that's coming up. And one that can ruin churches, shatter them, blow them apart. Okay? In, in man's wisdom, this is a big problem. But I didn't start off talking about man's wisdom, did I? Whose wisdom are we getting? God's. Let's remember that when you read in. Just, just read on and see the problem. See where it's going. And then if that gentleman comes back next week, I told him I would, at the end of the sermon, I would baptize him. And if you have a desire to be baptized, you can join him. As long as you read Romans 6. You understand, we don't baptize you into our church. We baptize you into the body of Christ. Okay, you join to Jesus, not to amazing grace. You join to Christ. Because that's where the power is. You know, if I can get you joined to Jesus, I can, I'm doing my job, right? I mean, when we have the Lord with us, man, watch out world. We're good to go, okay? And, and that's where the light, he's the light. I always tell kids, we're just like a lamp, you know, lantern, and the light is Jesus. He goes inside. All I got to do is be concerned, is my glass on the lantern clean? Because the only thing that's going to hinder the light getting out is... My sin is like soot on the glass, you know? You gotta e e e clean. Does, do any of you remember oil lamps? I know this is going back, but you know, the little flat wick with the little wheel on the side, and you light it and put that little glass dome. What happened when the glass dome, you know, the flame got a little high and it licked the inside with the, with the soot? It turned all black, right? And did it matter if the light was real good on the inside? If it was all licked with black soot, you hardly got any light out. It was like my little pocket light there. You know, but, but if you clean the glass and you put it over that, like, you go, wow, you can see. We actually used to use those on the farm to read by. I know this is going back, but that, that was like, you know, just light the little lamp, put two of them on the table next to you, one on each side, because one drives you nuts, you know, for the eyes, it like makes a shot. But you put two and you just put your book in between and all good. But I learned how to trim the wick just right. Tune it and make the light real perfect and even and bright. And I found it did no good if the glass was dirty. And Jesus is the light in us. So all we got to do is say, Lord, clean us up. Make my glass clean so I'll shine. And you can be a light in a dark place. You might be in a dark place in your job. 
your workplace, maybe in your family. Some of you got some family life that's dark. And God wants to let you shine. He's going to use you. Don't worry how dark it is. It only takes a little light when it's really dark to let him see the path. So just let him shine to you this week, okay? And we'll pick up next week with the problem. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the encouragement that the scriptures bring us. Lord, that you would love this church in a place that was so filled with wickedness and you would, and you would put in the, in the heart of the Apostle Paul to write these words to encourage their faith. Lord, I pray these words would sink into our heart that we could receive the things that would strengthen our faith from your holy scriptures and it would, it would truly bring us closer to you. I pray for each person here as we go this week, you would just let the, the part that spoke to them just carry with them, Lord that they could treasure it in their heart and continue to grow in their walk with you. Thanks for being our great problem solver. Thanks for sanctifying us, for loving us, for forgiving us, Lord, and for giving us your spirit. Fill us now with your spirit to overflowing as we go from this place, Lord. May your spirit give us strength. Anyone need strength this week besides me? Raise your hand, Lord. All these hands, I pray you just pour out your strength upon us as we wait on you and we prepare to go forward in this week. We ask it in Christ's name. And everyone that agrees said? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing a closing song. Send you off in the joy of the Lord and let you have a blessed week in the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.